Going live. Hello, we're live. Sorry, everybody. Technical difficulties. And of course, with the delay on this, you're not even listening to me talk right now. You're seeing me flounder about on my screen going, what the hell is wrong with this stupid stream? Yeah, I know. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Well, it's not fine, but it'll work out. Anyway, hello, everybody. Welcome to another live reading tonight because, you know, happy Halloween. We're going to be checking out Another. Now, Another is written by Yukito, Yukito Ayatsuji, and it is released by Yenon in English. They released it back in 2013 and then did a print edition, which was actually a big a honkin' collected 500-page novel that they released around 2014. Now, it, we sometimes refer to this as a light novel, but the truth is, is that the author is actually known as a horror writer, not as a, well, horror slash mystery writer, as opposed to a light novelist. So really, this is much more of like a novel than it is a light novel. There was an anime adaptation done of it. There was a manga done of it. And there was even a live action movie adaptation done of this one. So pretty big title, pretty popular title all around. But um, what's interesting is that even though this was released a little while ago, uh, Yen On has just licensed the sequel which is another 2001, which is set a couple years after the first book that we're going to take a look at tonight. Um, now, both with another and the sequel, another 2001, these were actually serialized in magazines and then finally collected into print editions. And I think actually that the sequel just finished in 2020, which maybe is why it took so long for Yen to pick this up because it actually wasn't done. So, if you like what you hear tonight, you can pick up a copy of another. I've got links in the description down below. And if you really dig it and you're like, man, I wish there was another one of these. Well, you've got a sequel coming out probably. Uh, I think currently they're talking around March of 2022. Uh, with the way shipping and delays of print and everything else are, it'll, it'll probably be later than that. So, But, you know, we'll get it eventually. In any case... This is Another by Yukito Ayatsuji. All right, let's go. So I'm going to be reading uh, chapter one of this book. Uh, this I'm just reading what's available for preview on Amazon, uh, just because that way uh, I hopefully am not breaking any copyright because this is widely and publicly available. And like I said, the actual collected book is almost 500 pages long, so... One little chapter I don't think is going to be that big a difference. So, let's get to it. Like you can see, there's like nine chapters interlude and all this stuff. Okay, part one. What? Why? Introduction. Do you know who Misaki is? The one in third year class three. Did you hear the story? Misaki? Is that someone's name? Yeah. No one knows what characters it's written with. It could be a last name, so it's not even necessarily a girl. Either way, Misaki so-and-so, or so-and-so Misaki, there was a student named Misaki 26 years ago. 26 years? Wow. That's a long time. That's back with the last emperor. 1972, the 42nd year of Emperor Hirohito's reign. I think that was the year Okinawa was returned. Okinawa came back? From where? Are you stupid? America was occupying it up till then, ever since the war ended. Oh, so that's why they're all still all those graves. Now that I think about it, the Winter Games were in Sapporo that year too. Pretty sure the Mount Asama Lodge incident was too. What lodge on Mount Asama? Are you for real? Whatever, I guess. Anyway, what matters is 26 years ago, there was a student named Misaki in class three of the third years. And then, are you sure you've never heard this story before? Huh, hold on. 
Uh, you're saying the kid was named Misaki, not Masaki. If it's Masaki, then yeah, I heard a little bit about it. Masaki? Huh. Maybe it's like that in some versions. Who'd you hear it from? An upperclassman in my club. What did he say? Uh, I don't know if it was 26 years ago, but there was a third year student named Masaki a long, long time ago. And um, uh, the way I heard it, it was a boy and something really weird happened in his class that year. But my upperclassman said it's a secret and you're not supposed to go around talking about it. So he said he couldn't tell me anything else. That's it? Yeah, he said, if you joke around about it, bad things will happen to you. I, I bet you it's one of those, the seven mysteries. You think so? You know how piccolo music starts playing in the music room in the middle of the night when no one's around, or how sometimes a hand all covered in blood reaches out of the lotus pond in the schoolyard. So I figure maybe this is the seventh one. I heard that the mannequins in their home ec room have actual heartbeats. They totally do. There's a ton beside that. I know like nine or ten of the seven mysteries at this middle school. But this story about Misaki or Masaki or whatever it was, I don't think it's one of those. Most of the stories feel pretty different from the rest of the seven mysteries. Wow, really? So, you know the details? Uh, a little, I guess. Tell me. What, you don't care if something bad happens to me? Oh, that's just a superstition, obviously. Uh, yeah, you're probably right. So tell me. Actually, I don't know if I should. Come on, I'll never ask you for anything else. And how many times now has it been the last thing you'll ever ask me for? <laughs> oh, for crying out loud. If I tell you, you can't go blabbing to everyone, you know? I won't tell anyone. I swear. Huh. Okay. Awesome. So, maybe it's Misaki or maybe it's Masaki. I guess for now, I'll say it's Misaki. Ever since their first year... This kid was popular with everyone. Brilliant student, accomplished athlete, really good at drawing, and even a talented musician. On top of all that, Misaki was gorgeous. And if he was a guy, he was chiseled. Whichever way, Misaki didn't have a single flaw. That sounds kind of obnoxious, don't you think? Nope. They say Misaki had a great personality too, not obnoxious or stuck up at all. The kid was nice to everyone and just casual enough. That's why the teachers and students and everybody else adored Misaki. Well, you get it. Misaki was popular. Huh. So people like that actually exist? So third year started and Misaki got put into class three when they switched up the room assignments. And then... All of a sudden, Misaki died. Whoa. It was still first semester, right before Misaki's 15th birthday. What happened? Was it a car accident? Did Misaki get sick? Uh, I heard it was a plane crash. Misaki's whole family was going to Hokkaido, and on the way back, the plane nosedived, but there are other theories too. So, the other kids got this horrible news, and it was a huge shock. I bet it was. How could this happen? Everybody was shouting. Other people were wailing. It can't be true. And a bunch of kids were absolutely wrecked with crying. The whole room teacher had no idea what to say to them. And the whole classroom had this, like, otherworldly atmosphere. In the middle of all that, somebody said... Misaki's not dead. I mean, look, can't you see Misaki's here? This kid pointed at Misaki's desk and said, Look, Misaki's right there. Where else would Misaki be? Misaki's alive and right over there. After that, student after student chimed in, backing up that first kid. 
It's true. Misaki's not dead. Misaki's alive. Misaki's right over there. What did they mean? Nobody wanted to believe that such a popular person had died so suddenly. They didn't want to accept it. That's what I figure. But it didn't end that day. The class kept it going for a long time after that. What do you mean? Everyone in class banded together after that and kept pretending. Hey, Misaki is still alive. I heard even the teacher was in on it all the way. It's true. You're right. All of you. Misaki isn't dead. In this classroom, at least, Misaki lives on as a member of our class. From now on, we all need to work together to graduate. All of us. Together. Or something like that, at least. It makes a good story, I guess. But, I don't know. It's kind of creepy. That was how they ended up spending the rest of their middle school careers. They left Misaki's desk exactly how it had been. And sometimes they would rest a hand on it and start talking to Misaki, who was supposed to be sitting there. Or they would goof around with Misaki or go home together. But, of course, it was all just an act. At the graduation ceremony, the principal was even considerate enough to set up a seat for Misaki. Hmm... I guess it is a good story. Yeah, basically, this is a beautiful story with some great source material. Actually, there's a scary twist at the end. Oh? Like what? After graduation, they took a group photo in the classroom. The next day, when they were looking at the developed picture, everyone noticed something. In this class photo, tucked away in a corner, they could see Misaki who couldn't possibly have been there. Misaki's face was pale, like a corpse, and smiling like everybody else's. Oh, that's a nice little uh, intro. (laughs) It just goes to show you the crazy things people will do with grief and what they'll do to try and cope. Man, can you imagine that? Jeez. All right. Uh-uh. Off we go. Chapter one. April. Spring came. I turned 15, and right after that, my left lung collapsed. Which sucks, by the way. I've never actually had it happen, but I know a guy who did, and it would, like, wrecked him for a long time. It was the third day after I left Tokyo to come to Yomiyama and leech off my grandparents on my mom's side. I was supposed to start at a middle school here the day after that, despite the fact that it was a little late in the term to be transferring somewhere. And just my luck, it happened the night before. April 20th, 1998. Monday, which was supposed to be my first day at a new school, a day for me to make a fresh start, turned out to be the first day of my second ever hospitalization. My first experience had been six months earlier, Just like last time, I'm back because my left lung collapsed. They told me you'll be hospitalized a week, maybe ten days. My grandmother, Tommy, arrived at the hospital early that morning. When she gave me the news, and I was already feeling isolated in the bed of the hospital room to which I'd only just been admitted, I fought back a pain in my chest and a suffocating feeling that seemed unlikely to ever subside. The doctor said there's most likely no need for surgery, but they're going to start a drainage treatment. I believe it was this afternoon. Oh. Okay. A few hours earlier, when the ambulance brought me in, the suffocating pain in my chest had felt much fiercer. After resting for a bit, I felt as if it was starting to get better. But to be honest... It was still pretty bad. The x-ray image of one of my lungs, shriveled up in a weird twist, flashed through my mind. Not that I wanted it to. I feel just terrible for you. So soon after you came here. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Grandma. Now, really, there's nothing for you to feel bad about. You can't help being ill. My grandmother looked into my face and smiled and the wrinkles around her eyes deepened twice as much. She had turned 63 this year, 
but she still seemed sprightly and was very kind to her grandson. This, even though we had almost never spoken alone together or been so close to one another. Um, what about Reiko? She wasn't late to work, was she? She's just fine. She stays focused, that girl. She went home and then left at the same time she always does. Could you tell Reiko that, um, I'm sorry for all the trouble. Late the night before, out of nowhere, I was struck by familiar symptoms. There was a disturbing gurgling sensation coming from inside my chest, and that unique splitting pain, and then the tightness. The moment I realized, it's happening again? I'd run with SOS half-panicked to Reiko, who had still been awake in the living room. There were eleven years between my mother, who had died, and this younger sister of hers, which makes her my aunt. As soon as I told her what was happening, she called an ambulance, and she even went with me to the hospital. Thank you, Reiko. I owe you so much. I wanted to proclaim my gratitude in my loudest voice, but in my condition, I was in too much pain to even think about doing that. Not to mention that I had trouble talking to her face to face. I don't know. I just get really nervous. I brought you a change of clothes. If there's anything else you need, you let me know. Thank you. I thank my grandmother in a raspy voice as she set a large paper bag down beside the bed. The pain seemed to increase when I shifted inattentively, so I lifted my chin slightly toward her and kept my head on the pillow. Grandma, um... What about my dad? I haven't told him yet. Do you suppose Yosuke is in India by now? I'm not sure how to reach him. I'll ask Reiko tonight. That's okay. I'll get in touch with him. If you just bring me the cell phone I left in my room. Oh, is that so? My dad's name is Yosuke Saka, Sakakibara. He works for some famous university in Tokyo doing research for cultural anthropology or socio-ecology or something like that. He became a professor in his early 40s, so he must be a pretty exceptional researcher. Still, I can't help harboring some pretty strong doubts about how exceptional he is as a father. Anyway, he doesn't live at home anymore. He casts off his only son and leaves the house empty while he flies around Japan and to other countries, doing, I don't even know what, field work, I guess? Thanks to that, ever since elementary school, I've had this weird confidence that my ability to keep house, at least, is better than any of my fellow students. Like my grandmother said, my dad had gone to India the previous week for work. The job had come up with practically no notice during spring vacation. He would be staying there and devoting himself to surveys and research activities for almost a year. Those are the basic circumstances that led me to being taken into my grandparents' home in Yomiyama with hardly any warning. Koichi, are you and your father getting along? My grandmother asked. Sure, I guess, I replied. Even if I thought it was tough having him for a father, it's not as if I hated him. Still... Yosuke is such a dutiful man. She sounded as if she was speaking mostly to herself. All this time has passed since Ritsuko died, and yet he still hasn't remarried. And he does so much to help us, too, at the least little word from us. Ritsuko is my mum's name. Fifteen years ago, the year I was born, she passed away at the young age of twenty-six. My father, Yosuke, was ten years older than her. From what I'd heard, my dad first saw my mom while he was working as a lecturer at his school, and she was one of his students. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. He won her over almost as soon as they met. You work fast, one of his old friends said when visiting our house one time, teasing my dad relentlessly. The guy seemed drunk. It was hard to conceive that my dad had lived without my without any women in his life ever since my mom died. I admit I'm speaking as his son, but he's a talented researcher, and even though he's 51 years old, he's a youthful man with a sweet personality who's pretty handsome. He's got a pretty good position in society and makes decent money, 
And since he's single on top of all that, I can't believe he's not more popular. Was he fulfilling an obligation to his deceased wife? Or being considerate of my feelings? Whatever it was, it had been long enough. I wanted him to get married again sometime and stop pushing the work of managing his household off on his son. That probably accounted for half of my feelings on the subject. <laughs> hey, Dad, I want you to get married so that I don't have to do housework anymore. <laughs> ah, all right. I'm just taking a look at the uh, comments for a second, just as I'm, oh my God, what the hell is happening? Oh, that's, that's creepy. Hold on. What the hell? Bruh. Guys, I was, I was like reading. Oh, that's, that's just not right. <laughs> oh, that's so creepy. Okay, stand by. We're going to, no, 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 don't do that. Stand by. We're going to, we're going to do something because, oh my God, it's Halloween. It's Halloween. Halloween's going crazy. Okay, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Oh no, it didn't go away. Oh no. That, that's just, no, like, I, no, we can't do that. We can't, we can't do that. And, I mean, now you guys can just hear me, but you can't see me. Oh, my God. And, like, even when I go here, oh, oh, that's so, that's so bad. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. I don't know if this is going to screw up the stream. If it does, I apologize right away. Wow, that is, that is some freakiness for Halloween. Ho, ho. Wow. Okay. Hold on. Stand by. We're going to, we're going to try and do something here. Oh my. Oh, okay. Okay. Hold on. Stand by. Now, of course, now my camera won't even turn off. Do, do, do. It never fails, guys. I don't know, you know, sometimes I kind of think that I'm a little bit cursed with the whole, like, live stream thing. One minute, everything's going just great, and then the next minute it's like, no, not today. Not today. Okay, let's see, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna try this again. We're gonna try this again and see what happens. Oh, oh boy. Will my face be all split screen freaky? No! All right, cool. We'll just minimize that window a little bit. All right, we're back. We're back. We're live. Oh, yeah. Happy Halloween, indeed. Indeed. You can't... <laughs> oh, CL, that's funny. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm helping. The yeah, right? The camera's all like... Well, like, there was, like, another me. The camera was, like, split. Oh. Freaky. Wow. <laughs> like, okay. Now I'm starting to think, like, this whole thing is kind of cursed. Oh, jeez. Uh, uh, okay. All right. Yeah. Good times. <laughs> uh, okay. Hey, it wouldn't be a Justice Our Stone stream without total ineptitude. Anyway. Uh, okay. Number two. We're still in chapter one, but it's just part two. A collapsed lung is in fact a condition called spontaneous pneumothorax. More correctly referred to as primary spontaneous pneumothorax. Hey, who thought you'd be learning medical terminology while watching a light novel reading stream? There you go. It's common among young men who have a tall, thin body type. 
The cause is pretty much unknown, but it's said that in more than a few cases, fatigue or stress can be a trigger in combination with a person's basic physique. Just like it sounds, collapsed means that part of the lung ruptures and air leaks into the pleural cavity. The balance of pressure gets messed up and the lung withers up like a balloon with a hole in it. It's associated with chest pain and difficulty breathing. This illness, the mere thought of which is terrifying, it was six months ago, in October of last year, when I first experienced it. At first, a weird pain started in my chest, and it felt as though if I moved, I would immediately lose my breath. I thought if I just waited it out, it would get better, but after a couple days, I still hadn't improved. In fact, it was getting worse and worse, so I told my dad about it, and we went to the hospital, and as soon as they took an x-ray, it became clear that my left lung had undergone a pneumothorax and was in an intermediate state of collapse. I was hospitalized the same day. The lead physician decided to give me a treatment called pleural drainage. I was given a local anesthetic. Then they cut my chest open with a scalpel and inserted a thin tube called a trochar catheter into my pleural cavity. The treatment continued for a full week while my collapsed lung reinflated to its original shape and the hole sealed up, and then I was released without further incident. At the time, the physicians used the words, full recovery, but in the same breath he told us, the chance of recurrence is 50%. Back then, I tried not to think too deeply about how much of a risk that was. About all I did was acknowledge that, okay... I might get like that again some day, but I never thought I would face this miserable fate so quickly. It was such bad timing. To be honest, I was pretty depressed. After my grandmother went home, first thing that afternoon I was called to a treatment room in the internal medicine department, where they began the pleural drainage, just like six months before. Luckily, the lead physician wasn't terrible. The pain had been incredible when they shoved the tube into me six months ago, but this time it wasn't bad at all. Just like last time, if the air escaped through the tube and my lung reinflated and the hole closed up, I'd be set for a welcome release. However, they told me that when the condition has recurred once already like this, the risk of another relapse is even higher. If it kept happening, they would have to consider surgery. Hearing that made me even more depressed. My grandmother came again that evening and brought me my cell phone, but I would tell my dad what was going on in the morning. That's what I decided. It wasn't as if rushing to tell him would change anything. My condition wasn't life-threatening, and there was no need to worry him by letting him hear how feeble my voice was. The respirator beside my bed emitted a soft huffing the sound of the air it sucked out of my chest being expelled through water inside the machine. I remembered the generic warning label that said, may interfere with medical devices, and turned my cell phone off. Then, feeling annoyed by the familiar pain and tightness, I looked out the window of my room. I was in the municipal hospital's inpatient ward, an old five-story building. My room was on the fourth floor. I could see hazy points of white illumination below the darkening sky. They were city lights from the tiny mountain town where Ritsuku, the mother I knew only from photographs, had been born and raised. Yomiyama. How many times have I visited this town now? The thought cut across my consciousness idly. There were only a few instances that I remembered. I don't recall much from when I was little, maybe three or four times in elementary school. Was this the first time since starting middle school? Or maybe not. I was pondering that maybe not when my mind ground to an abrupt halt. A deep noise was building out of nowhere. It hung over me, felt as though it was crushing me. Unconsciously, I let out a small sigh. The anesthetic must have worn off. The incision below my armpit, where the tube had been inserted, was throbbing, mingling with the ever-present chest pain. How we doing? Have we gone all freaky again? Nope, we're all good. Okay. 
No, I'm not crawling through any TV screens. Yes. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, good times. Good times. Just for interest's sake, what happens if I go to the... Where I go full screen? Oh, it's still not funked up. That's good. All right. Number three. My grandmother came to see me every day after that. The hospital was pretty far from home, I thought, but she would laugh lightly and tell me it wasn't much trouble since she drove herself. Here was a grandmother you could count on, although stuff at home was probably getting neglected at least a little bit, and she must have been worried about my grandfather, real hay, who'd been getting a little senile lately. I felt terrible regardless. Thank you, Grandma. I couldn't help expressing my deep gratitude in my heart. The effects of the plural drainage were going according to schedule, and on my third day in the hospital, the pain had pretty much subsided too. The problem that arose then was sheer boredom. I still couldn't even walk around on my own. For one thing, my body remained linked to a machine via a tube. Additionally, I had an IV drip twice a day. It was pretty tough even getting to the bathroom, and of course, I hadn't been able to shower for a couple of days. My room was a small one-person deal that included a little coin-operated TV, but even if I turned it on, they only air boring shows in the middle of the day. Should I give up and watch anyway, or read one of the books that my grandmother brought me, or listen to music? This was how I passed the time that no one would have called relaxing in idleness. On my sixth day in the hospital, April 25th, a Saturday afternoon, Reiko came to my room. I'm so sorry I haven't been able to come see you, Koichi. She told me apologetically that she got home from work late during the week, no matter how hard she tried. But of course, I understood that perfectly well. If I complained about it, I'd have been the one who needed to apologize. With as much cheerfulness as I could manage, I told her about my condition and how I was recovering. About the lead physician's prediction, which I'd received that morning, that if everything went well, I'd be discharged early next week, and the latest definitely sometime that month. Then you should be able to go to school after Golden Week, huh? Reiko turned her eyes to the window. I was sitting up in my bed, so my gaze naturally followed hers. This hospital is built on a hill near a mountain called Yubigaoka. At the eastern edge of town, well, look. What you see over there is a bunch of mountains to the west. There's also a place called Asamidai over there. What weird names. Yubigaoka, because you can get a gorgeous view of the setting sun. And Asami, because you get a gorgeous view of the sunrise. I guess that's where the names come from. But the name of the town is Yomiyama, right? There's a mountain that's actually called Yomiyama north of here. The town is in a basin, but the entire thing consists of gentle hills running south to north. I didn't have a complete grasp of the fundamental geography of the town yet. Maybe Reiko had noticed, which had prompted her simplistic tour. Maybe she thought, seeing the view out the window, that this presented the perfect opportunity. Do you see that over there? Reiko raised her right hand and pointed. That green bit, running all the way north to south. That's the Yomiyama River that runs through the middle of town. On the other side of it, do you see? That's the field at school. Can you make it out? Oh. Uh. I lifted the top half of my body off the bed and squinted in the direction Reiko was pointing. Oh, that wide white spot? That's it. Reiko turned back around toward me and smiled faintly. That's the Yomiyama North Middle. The school you'll be attending. Interesting. You went to a private school in Tokyo, right? One of those escalator schools with integrated middle and high schools? Yeah, I, I guess. You might feel a little out of place at public school, but you'll do fine, won't you? Probably, yeah. You're going to be behind on the work for April, what with this sudden hospitalization. Oh, I'm not worried about that. At my last school, we were already halfway done with the stuff for third year middle school. Well, well, impressive. Studying's going to be such a breeze for you. I don't know if it'll be that easy. 
I suppose I'm obligated to tell you not to get cocky. Did you go to that school, Reiko? Yep. I graduated 14 years ago. I think it was. Now you're going to figure out how old I am. So then my mom went there too? Yep. Ritsuko came out of North Middle too. There's also a school called Yomiyama South Middle in town, which is South Middle. Some people also call North Middle North Yomi. North Yomi? Oh, I get it. Reiko, dressed in a black pantsuit and beige blouse, had a slender build and a fair-skinned slender face. Her stick straight hair grew past her shoulders. With that haircut, her features seemed somehow to resemble my mother's, whose face I knew only from photographs. When that realization struck me, every atom of my heart began to ache helplessly, as if infused with a flush of fever. I said that I'm bad at talking to Reiko face to face like this because I get nervous. That's eight tenths of the problem, and this was probably the root. I guess if you're not worried about the schoolwork, then the problem really will be the difference in how they do things at public school. You'll probably be confused about some things at first, but I'm sure you'll get used to it soon enough. And then Reiko told me that once I came home from the hospital and could start attending school, she would tell me the North Yomi Fundamentals. Then her eyes fell to the paperbacks on my bedside table. Huh, I didn't know you liked these kinds of books, Koichi. Oh, um, uh, I guess. There were four books in all. They were both long books broken into two volumes, Salem's Lot and Pet Cemetery by Stephen King. I'd finished the first volume of Pet Cemetery right before Reiko came by. In that case, I'll tell you about the seven mysteries of North Yomi, too. The seven mysteries? Every school has them, but North Yomi's are a little bit different. It's gone up to more than eight since I went there. You're not interested? Honestly? I didn't really care about real-life ghost stories like that, but... No, you've definitely got to tell me, I replied, crafting a smile for her. Take another little break. A little sip of water. All right. <clears throat> Before lunch on the next day, the 26th, a Sunday, like always, my grandmother had come to present me with miscellaneous odds and ends. Then, with a formulaic... All right, I'll see you again tomorrow. She left me and returned home. She must have passed right by them. I never would have expected or even thought to dream up these visitors who had come to see me. There was a knock, and the door to my room opened. It was a young nurse named Mizuno, whom I had been relying on completely ever since I'd been admitted. Go ahead, she said, ushering them in, a boy and a girl I had never seen before in my life. I was, of course, surprised, but... Since they were both roughly my age and wearing school uniforms, I soon guessed where this visit had originated. Hello, you're Koichi Sakakimara, right? The ambassador, or so it felt to me, on the right spoke. The boy, medium build, medium height, black school uniform with a standing collar, silver-rimmed glasses accented his smooth, soft-featured face and narrow eyes. We're students from Yomiyama North Middle, third year, Class three. Ah, uh, hi. My name is Kazami, Tomohiko Kazami, and this is Sakuragi. Yukari Sakuragi, nice to meet you. The girl wore a navy blazer. They were both completely run-of-the-mill middle school uniforms, but the style was totally different from the private school I'd attended in Tokyo. Sakuragi and I are the class representatives for class three, so we've come on everyone else's behalf. From my perch in the bed, I grunted, then cocked my head and asked the most obvious question. Why are you here? You're transferring to our school, right? Yukari Sakuragi asked. She, too, wore silver-rimmed glasses, just like Kazami. She had a slightly chubby build and a simple haircut that came to her shoulders. You were actually supposed to start last Monday, but then you got sick all of a sudden. That's what we heard. So we decided to visit you as class representatives. Um, this is from all of us. She held out a bouquet of colorful tulips. Tulips mean considerateness or philanthropy. I learned that later, when I looked it up. 
The teacher was asking how you were doing too, Tomohiko Kazami continued. We heard it was a lung condition called pneumothorax. Are you all right? Oh, yeah, thanks. As I answered, I stifled the smile that was rising on my face. I'd been caught off guard by their sudden visit, but I was also genuinely pleased by it. Plus, the way the two of them had come here was so picturesque. They almost seemed like class representative characters you'd see in an anime or something. So that also struck me as oddly amusing. Fortunately, I guess that's what I'm supposed to say, even in a situation like this. I'm recuperating on schedule, so I think they'll be able to take the tube out soon. That's a relief. What a horrible thing to have happened so suddenly. As they spoke, the two emissaries of third year class three looked at each other. We heard that you moved here from Tokyo, Sakakibara, Sakuragi said as she set the tulips on the windowsill. For some reason, it sounded as if she, she was gently feeling me out. I nodded. Yeah. You were at K... Dot, 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 middle school, weren't you? That's amazing. It's such a famous private school. Why did you... We came here for family reasons. Is this your first time living in Yobiyama? It is, but why would you ask that? I just thought maybe you lived here, even if it was a long time ago. I've visited before, but I've never lived here. Did you ever stay for very long? Kazami came with a follow-up. What weird questions. The thought nagged at me slightly, and I gave a vague response. Uh, my mum is from here. I guess when I was still little I might have, but I don't really remember. The rapid-fire interrogation ended there, and Kazami walked toward the bed. Here. He pulled a large envelope from his bag and handed it to me. What's this? Notes for classes since the start of the first semester. I made a copy, so if you want them, you can have them. Wow! You didn't have to do that. Thank you. When I peeked at the contents of the envelope in my hands, I saw it was, indeed, all stuff I'd already learned at my old school. Still, his consideration touched me, and I thanked them again. If this was how it was going to be, I might actually be able to forget all the terrible stuff that had been happening since the previous year. I think I'll be able to start school after we get back from Golden Week. I'm looking forward to it. Us too. I thought I saw Kazami shoot Sakuragi a wink, and then, with a vaguely hesitant expression, he held his right hand out to me. Er, Sakakibara, would you shake hands? That left me speechless for a second. Shake hands? The boy who was class representative was suddenly asking to shake hands, the very first time we'd ever met each other. In a place like this? What did that even... I considered that maybe I should just let it go and say, well, public school students are different. Or maybe it was a difference between Tokyo and the countryside? A difference in attitudes? The thoughts went around and around in my head, but I could hardly reject them and say, uh, no. I played it innocent and extended my right hand too. There wasn't much force behind Kazami's handshake, even though he was the one who'd offered. And maybe it was my imagination but I thought I felt dampness, as if he was in a cold sweat. Sorry, go ahead. Duck off camera for just a second here. I gotta... I gotta... I gotta... Uh, curse of the stuffy nose <laughs> talking about curses all right <clears throat> how much more do i have to go all right just this one five my eighth day in the hospital monday was the day of a modest liberation when they confirmed that the leak of air from my lung had stopped completely they took out the drainage tube this meant i was finally freed from my link to the machine when the procedure wrapped up in the morning, I left my room to escort my visiting grandmother out of the building so that I could breathe the open air for the first time in a long while. According to the doctor, they would watch my condition for another two days, and if there was no change, I could be released. 
but I would have to rest as much as possible for a little while. I understood that part painfully well without having to be told, given my experience six months earlier. So I couldn't go to school until May 6th, which was after the break, after all. I watched my grandmother's rugged, inky black Nissan Cedric drive off, and then I sat down on a bench I'd found in the front lawn of the inpatient ward. It was beautiful weather, befitting the day of my liberation. Warm spring sunbeams, brisk cool breeze. I could hear the chirping of wild birds here and there, probably because the mountains were so close by. I even heard the cry of a warbler, a sound unheard of in Tokyo, occasionally cutting in to the other songs. I closed my eyes and took slow, deep breaths. The place where the tube had been ached a bit, but the chest pain and difficulty breathing had dis disappeared completely. Yeah, this was good. How wondrous a thing to be healthy. After sinking into a momentary swell of emotion that I wouldn't exactly call youthful, I took out my cell phone, which I'd brought with me from my room. This seemed like a good enough time to call my dad. I was outside the building, so I didn't have to be worried about the warnings against interfering with medical devices and whatever. I was pretty sure the time difference between Japan and India was three hours, or maybe four, it was after 11 o'clock where I was, so 7 or 8 o'clock there? After some hesitation, I ended up turning off the cell phone I'd just activated. I knew very well how my dad slept in in the morning. He was probably pretty tired, what with his survey research activities in a foreign country too. It would have been cruel to roust him from bed for this after all this time. I sat on the bench, zoning out for a while after that. When I got to my feet, it was because lunchtime was approaching. I want to be clear, the hospital food did not taste good. But for a 15-year-old recovering from illness, hunger is a life-or-death issue. I went back to the inpatient ward, cut through the lobby, and headed for the elevator bay. The doors to one elevator were just starting to close, so I quickly squeezed through them. There was already someone on the elevator. Oh, excuse me. The same navy blazer as Yukari Sakuragi had worn when she'd revisited the day before. Did that mean this girl also went to Yomiyama North Middle? Shouldn't she have been at school at this time of day? She was petite and slightly built and had an androgynous face, the bone structure of which was too fine. Pure black hair and a shaggy bob cut. Her skin color was quite washed out in contrast. I'm not sure what to call it, but it looked like white paraffin, to use a somewhat old-fashioned term. Plus, the thing that caught my attention more than anything else was the white eye patch bandaging her left eye. Did she have some kind of eye disease? Or had she been hurt? <coughs> Pardon me. With my mind cut up in all these thoughts, I was embarrassingly slow to realize the direction the elevator I'd chosen was traveling. It was going down, not up. I wasn't headed for the upper floors. The car had started moving toward the basement. I looked at the buttons arrayed on the control panel and saw that B2 was lit up. Letting my own button selection slide, I seized on an impulse and sp spoke to the girl with the eye patch. I'm sorry, are you a student at North Yobi? The girl barely nodded her head, silent showing no hint of any other movement. You're going to the second basement level? Is there something you need to do down there? Yes. But it's not... I'm dropping something off. Her tone of voice was cool and detached, as if all her emotions had been shut off. Half my body is waiting there, the poor thing. While I stood bewildered by those enigmatic words, the elevator stopped and the doors opened. The girl in the eye patch slipped silently past me and went out into the hallway, her footsteps making no sound. Something sickly pale protruded through a gap in her hands, pressed tightly against her chest. My eyes fixed on it. I could see something pale. A tiny doll hand. Hey! I held the elevator doors open and stuck my head and shoulders out to call after the girl. What's your name? The girl the only person walking down the dimly lit hallway, reacted to my voice and came to a momentary standstill. But she didn't turn around. May, she answered curtly. May, Bisaki. 
Then the girl walked away, as if gliding over the linoleum floor. I watched her go, not breathing, while experiencing a touch of despondency and, at the same time, a foreboding that I could hardly find words to describe. The second basement level of the inpatient ward. I didn't think there were even room, exam rooms or nursing rooms on this floor, let alone patients' rooms. It was knowledge I'd absorbed naturally while hospitalized. All that was down there were the food storage rooms, the mechanical rooms, and, I was pretty sure, the memorial chapel. In any event, this was the first up-close encounter I shared with the strange girl, May. By the time I learned that Misaki was written with the characters for Viewing the Cliffs, and May was sound, April had ended, and May had just barely begun. All right. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, we'll just click off there, because... What's all uh, done for now? So, that was the first chapter of Another by Yukito Ayotsuji. Um, I mean, here's the thing. Without uh, getting into spoilers, <laughs> the book does pick up. Like, I, you know, there's all this, like, build-up in that about his health condition, uh, you know, Koichi's health condition, giving you some background in his living situation now. Um, you know, his meeting some classmates that'll play a larger role later on. Um, but, you know, what I liked about that was, pardon me, I've been guzzling this water, so I'm getting the hiccups now. But, um, what I kind of liked about it was all the little subtlety things, right? Like, you know, how when he shook the hand of the class representative, he thought there was a bit of a damp sweat. Uh, you know, that uncomfortable, the uncomfortableness of him talking to his aunt and sort of relating it back to his, his mom. Um, you know, like there, there's a lot of different sort of layers, a lot of things going on in this which I find kind of interesting. And of course, like that introduction, it sort of sets up a little bit of that mystery and sort of lets you know that things might go wrong. And of course, you know, the last name, Misaki, given by May there at the end, you just know automatically, you're like, uh-oh, uh-oh, something bad's going to happen, something bad. And yes, bad things happen. Surprisingly and shockingly bad things, I'll say too. Like, wow. And yes, you're right. The uh, Yukito Ayatsuji is married to the woman who wrote The Twelve Kingdoms. So there you go. Yeah. So, what do you guys think? Another. Has anybody actually seen the anime that's uh, hanging around here? Or maybe? No? I saw the anime a couple of years ago. So I was kind of curious to see what this was. And like I said, uh, you know, it's Halloween. Is it still Halloween? I'm not, I haven't been reading that long. Have I? It's still only 1030 here. Yes. Yeah, so it's still Halloween. <laughs> there aren't many light novels that are like ghost stories. Like certainly not like another is. I mean, another borders on that sort of ghost horror type book. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I, you know, I was sitting here today and I'm like, you know, I should do something tonight. So here we are. Here we are talking about another. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I, uh, I kind of like that. I, I must admit it now makes me curious to read the rest of it now that I've read that opening bit. Especially because I kind of feel like that opening segment there, it's doing sort of a lot of legwork about laying out the character of Koichi and laying out his living situation and everything else. But it's, it is still kind of slow, obviously. Like, I mean, it's all build up, right? It's all stuff that you figure is probably going to play out down the road kind of thing. So, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of cool. I, uh, I'll have to take a look and see. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it's like almost 500 pages, this book. So it's, uh, it ain't exactly one of those bird through it quick kind of novels. Well, I guess it depends on how fast you read, but for me, it would take me a little while, I think. So anyway, yeah. Oh, it's not even big printing. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So that's it. So, yeah. I do love how he does shout outs to like Stephen King too. I uh, like, <laughs> you know how he's reading really like Pet Cemetery and Salem's Lot. I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, you know, it, it kind of made me like, you know, it's like, is that, are you doing that because he's a contemporary? Are you doing that? You know, like, you know, I, you just when you have Arthur's lay out a name like that, I was kind of like, is he really trying to tell us something about Koichi himself with the fact that he likes to read like these sort of like horror novels and stuff like that? Or is it just like so that he could name drop Stephen King? <laughs> Although... You know what? As far as I understand, Yukito Ayatsuji is fairly well regarded, so I don't think he really needs to name drop anyone. Um, in fact, I was looking at this earlier on the, the Wikipedia page. They were saying that one of his first mystery novels it was recently listed as like the number eight in the top 100 Japanese novels of all time. So, um, and funny enough, it's actually, uh, what was it called? The Decacon Murders or something. And it has received an English translation. So you can actually go check it out. I should have put a link to that in the description, but I didn't know that I'd be talking about it because, you know, here we are. But yeah, so another yeah. Oh, ah, that is, yes. So, uh, we were watching, um, there's this on Apple TV, there's a channel called, uh, shutter, which is like a horror channel. And there was this, uh, I guess the history, Eli Roth's history of horror. And they're interviewing Stephen King and he's wearing this t-shirt and it says, remember, you can't have manslaughter without the laughter. <laughs> uh, it's good times. It's good times. That's a good one, CL. A true, the true story. It is kind of funny. And it's got like, just like this happy salesman, like. Eh. <laughs> uh, well, I hope you all had a happy Halloween. Uh, you know. They were actually allowing kids trick-or-treating this year. We didn't have to COVID kibosh it, which is nice. Uh, not that, you know, we make a big issue of Halloween here. Most, uh, like my boys are all grown up and stuff, but still. But still. Uh, so, what's going on? Uh, tomorrow, for those of you that are still watching, there are a few of you watching still, um, uh, Tomorrow, the top 10 in Japan. I've recorded it. It's coming up. I said I was taking kind of a break from things while I got accustomed to the new job and stuff. And I'll be honest, I'm still trying to get accustomed. It seems like I'm learning new things every single day. And the workload is just the workload. Um, but, you know, there's a couple videos I want to get back to and get going on the channel. And, uh, you know, if you want to see me just kind of like shooting the breeze while I get wrecked by creepers on Minecraft, of course I have those videos too. You can watch. I am really terrible at the game. I, I, there's like, I'm not one. I am a person to watch to see how a noob flounders. I am not a person to watch because I build interesting things, but maybe one day, maybe one day it certainly is, um, certainly is interesting a change of pace all right cool so um yeah what's going on new and interesting oh cl you're just trying to get me to throw out everything um i don't know what all new and interesting is going on uh we've talked about doing like live 
unboxings of the few Figmas that I have, because believe it or not, I have a whole bunch of those that I've never even opened before. We've talked about, oh my God, we've talked about so much stuff. I, I find that, like, this is the kind of the disconcerting thing about life right now is that it's like I'm 47 years old, so I'm like staring down the throat of 50, and I kind of really just don't know what I want to do with my life. <laughs> you know, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, I wrote a book a couple months back, but then there was so much stuff that I want to do different with it. I just kind of set it aside and now I'm playing around with another idea. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I kind of want to bring a little bit more variety to the channel. I want to do some different stuff. Uh, you know, uh, I, I watched as like quite honestly, hundreds of people unsubscribed from the channel when I started doing Minecraft gameplay. Uh, I, I kind of think people thought that I was just saying, screw it. I'm just going to play Minecraft from now on. And I'll be honest, like at times it's tempting because it's so easy just to slap on your headset, hit play and like go and just kind of chill out and not have to worry about organizing your thoughts and, you know, doing all the reading and doing all this and doing the prep work and then having to record and edit and research and having to, you know, yeah. All that kind of stuff. So I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do stuff. And yes, they won't all be Minecraft, but Minecraft is going to be part of it because, you know, so I, you know, just play Minecraft. I slap on some nice lo-fi. We just chill out. Sometimes, like I said, we talk about light novels. Sometimes we talk about other stuff. I mean, the joke of it is, is that I'm like saying it's like the closest thing that I'm going to get to an isekai. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. The new job is not, um, yeah, well, I won't talk about the new job. I can't talk too much about it. There's so much stuff in it that I can't talk to anybody about because it's like, breaking privacy and all this kind of stuff but let's just say that it has made me see my old position in a much different light and has seen made me see some of my co-workers in a much different and not necessarily flattering light yeah working some in some place for such a long time like i've been there for almost 16 years so working there for such a long time and then all of a sudden becoming management, it's like, man, so different all of a sudden. Like you just, it's just like so eye opening. All these things that you used to think about, guess about, try and figure out just the now are shoved in your face. It's like reality. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, I do talk about light novel stuff in Minecraft. But not always. Sometimes I'm just playing. Because sometimes, you know, you're just, you're just playing. Like, that's just how it is. Because I, I think the thing is, is like, so right now with the, uh, my current job, I spend a lot of my day, like, doing investigations, listening to calls, having to go through all sorts of paperwork and research and everything else. And, uh, you know, when I get home, it's, again, it's kind of nice just to pop on a game that you don't have to think too hard about. It's like, let's go dig. Let's build some stuff. Hey, cool. Let's dig some more. Let's build some more stuff. I mean, yeah. Ultimately, um, I would like to make the Minecraft a bigger thing. Like, I'd like to get an actual server sometime and build sort of a world that I can then invite people into. I want to sort of build it like a mythology and stuff into it. Like, I think this is kind of my thing right now is that these live recordings, these live things, I always start talking. <laughs> I hope you all don't mind. I mean, you know, you don't have to keep watching. You can turn it off anytime, but, um, you know, I, and I'm sure like maybe if you, some of you feel this way too, like, you know, like, 
you feel that need that you want to create. You want to build something, but you just don't know what, you know, it's like, like I've written four novels. I'd like to write some more, but I'm kind of like, but is that what I feel like I want to direct energy to, you know, I, yeah. Like I said, this is the thing. You're 47 years old. What have you done with your life and what are you going to do with your life? Because you got a good chunk of years, hopefully, fingers crossed, still ahead of you. So anyway, I'm just trying to like work the demons out. So what's going to be happening in the channel right now, right now, is going to be, yeah, I'm going to get the top 10s going again. But I'm only doing the top 10 individual volumes because the top 10 light novel series list is just stupid. I mean... Half the light novels that are out there don't even show up on the list. It's dumb. And most of the time the list doesn't change that much. It just changes whenever there's a new anime season. Um, so I'm not doing that. So I'm cutting that back a little bit. But I'm doing the part that I think is more interesting. I will probably do more live readings of this kind of stuff. Um, so, because that gives me a chance to like have some more variety of things on the channel. Because right now, like my reading time is so skimp and so scarce, it's not even funny. I actually did pick up a copy of the Haunted Bookstore, and I am giving it a read slowly but surely, but emphasis on slowly. Uh, but you all know that I was like hyped to read that book. I mean, the cover art is gorgeous. Um, but and, and I just love, like, I really am hoping that it has that, like, spirited away feel to it. Because, um, yeah, that's something that I'd really like to check out. So uh, I'm going to be reading that one. I will probably talk about it at some point. I don't know whether I'm going to do, like, review reviews or whether I'm just going to do, like, chats about it. Uh, I don't know. I'll have to figure that all out. So there is stuff in the works. There is stuff going on. And uh, we'll see how that goes so you know what it's late i gotta go to work in the morning that's the other thing man this like i do eight to four monday through friday i used to do four 12 hour shifts and then i'd be off for four days so you'd work four days and then be off for four days now i'm gonna tell you 12 hour shift sucks donkeys it's not fun okay and you know, your body gets to like that eight hour mark and it is like, this is balls. You need to go home. Um, that part blows, but man, getting those four days off. Wow. I just, you know, when I only have two days off, I'm like, how the hell have people lived their lives and ever gotten anything done with only two days off in a row? It makes no sense to me. Oh, well, we'll have to see what goes on. Uh, exchange writing ideas with viewers. Well, okay. So here's the thing. Well, we won't get too deep into that. I really do have to shut this down and get to bed, but, um, but yeah, I am, I've been trying to think, basically I've been trying to think of like, what kind of, what can I get on the channel that, you know, it still has light novel stuff, but you know, I, I want to sort of bring some of the other stuff that I enjoy. Like, you know, yeah, I'm playing some Minecraft. It's like a nice way to unwind, chill out, just chat about whatever. It doesn't really matter. Right. Um, then, uh, yeah. Then, yeah, I would like to eventually get to the point where like the Minecraft moves more into like a story driven thing. Like there's like a server. I want to build like a world. Like I want to build like things for people to explore and find, and you know, like hints and all this kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, I want to be, bring more writing into the channel because that is something I want to do. Actually, NaNoWriMo is starting in like an hour and a bit. National Novel Writing Month. Try to write a 50,000 word novel within a month. I actually thought I might try doing it this year, but I really don't think I'm going to be able to. I just don't foresee myself being able to write that fast, but um, maybe if I had plotted it all out ahead of time, but... I've never been able to complete NaNoWriMo successfully, so I don't think this will be the year that I break that. <laughs> All right. Anyway, my friends, thank you so much for joining in for the reading and hanging out and 
forgiving me for all the weird ass glitches that happened while this stream was going on and for hanging around as I just kind of shoot the breeze after the fact. I really do appreciate it. In the meantime, thank you so much. Like I said, there's going to be a new video up for y'all tomorrow that you can check out. I hope you like it. Till then, bye-bye for now. Then I have to go through five windows to find where I can actually end the stream. <laughs> bye, guys.